Good evening, everybody. I have to say I love the intro because I get to see all of my past guests. And what I really love about conducting this show and hosting this podcast is not only that you join in and you subscribe on YouTube, which I absolutely love you for that. You get Christmas cards, you get birthday cards, you get Valentine's Day cards. Just ring that bell. But I love making friends on the show. And that's what this is all about. You know, it seems like every green room session that I do with a brand new guest, I sort of explain how I love that virgin response. I love a brand new conversation. There's nothing like meeting someone new for the very first time and having an amazing experience. And that's what we get to do. So that little intro just shows me all of my friends um, and they're just, magnanimous people. This evening, I have a magnanimous lady connected, and I can't believe that she has time for me, but she does. So let's talk about our sponsor this evening before I tell you all about Miss Lisa Langlois, who is connected. We have NeuroMints. I actually had a NeuroMint while I was waiting to go live. These things are so great. And the reason why I love them, especially this you know evening time, it's nine o'clock here on the East Coast. So I know in about an hour and a half, I need to be on the downswing of being able to calm down and quiet my mind and go to sleep. But I have to be on point right now, right? This doesn't give you too much caffeine and it's full of good B vitamins that it keeps you fresh and alert and clear but it's not so much caffeine that you're ever going to be jittery. And I love that they are now sold at CVS pharmacies. It seems like there's always a CVS around in every city, in every rural area. So that really makes them so convenient to go and get. Because not everybody shops online. Energy, great taste, and convenience in one product. So these are the mints. I also have gum, but you know, of course, on a podcast, they can't be like, so you, know, you can't chew the gum. So I put that in my in my purse when I'm driving the kids around. I'm definitely a gum chewer. And it's small enough to put into any bag, but they're big enough that they're not going to get lost in the busiest bag. That's what I love about the packaging. Functional gum and mints to energize, calm, and focus you in the moment. 40 milligrams of caffeine. That's great because that's like half a cup of your, your standard size of a cup of joe. 40 milligrams of caffeine, B6, B12, natural amino acids for focus and clarity. Refresh your state of mind with some neuro gum or neuro mints today. You can go to getneuro.com. That's G E T N E U R O.com. You can also go to your local GNC, CVS pharmacies, Walmart, or buy it on Amazon. All right, everybody. Now, I have that lipstick that I feel like is sticking to my teeth, but I know it's not. <laughs> so I apologize if I have an odd new nervous tick where I'm doing one of these. I promise I'll calm it down. <laughs> so without any further ado, really, I would love to begin to, inter to uh, introduce the lovely lady connected to this evening, Lisa Lang Hua. She stars in a brand new film that's on Tubi. It's a chance for Christmas. We're going to see the trailer. We're going to hear all about the filming and we're going to be able to talk to her about what her experiences were and why she loves it so much. So as I said, it's a new romantic comedy now streaming on Tubi TV. She is also working on a new film for the Hallmark Channel, and she is adapting a novel into a film that she will produce, making it the first time she's producing a film and adapting a novel, which is a female-driven and about the Me Too movement. That's going to be a really interesting part of our conversation. I cannot wait to hear more. Lisa is known for her films like Class of 1984 with Michael J. Fox, The Nest, Deadly Eyes, Happy Birthday to Me. All of those are horror thrillers. So she's much in demand at horror thriller conventions. She is also often referred to as a scream queen as a result of her horror films. And without any further ado, I'd like to welcome to the broadcast, Miss Lisa Langlois. How are you, Lisa? Well, I'm so glad to be part of this Cooper Connection. 
<laughs> <laughs> I am thrilled to have you this evening. Now, I was doing some reading where it had mentioned that you grew up in Ontario, Canada. Yes. And are you currently in Los Angeles right now? Yes, I am. I actually, I spent half my life in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, when, when I'm here, I, I say, gee, I, I really want to be here. And then when I'm back in Toronto, I say I want to be back in Toronto. I'm really pretty much uh, a hybrid. And my accountant says we call you kind of people straddlers. <laughs> and we straddle both sides of the border. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, that was one of the questions I had written down that I really wanted to ask you first before we get into some of the projects that you have worked on, are going to work on, um, and currently working. So growing up in Ontario and then, you know, bringing that career, bringing your talent to Los Angeles, did Canada prepare you for what you were going to experience in Los Angeles? Did you already know? What, what do you think about that? No, I, I, I actually wasn't prepared at all for the Hollywood aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I wasn't prepared for the uh, Hollywood Me Too aspect of it. But where I was really prepared is that in Canada at the time, you know, they, they, they just didn't have big budget films and they still don't like the studios. And especially back then, you would only do two takes and a second take was just in case there was a hair in the gate. So I was always prepared to be ready to not expect a lot of takes and to get it done right away. And also that nothing seemed like a hardship that it was low budget because that's how I was groomed. So, so I was prepared in the sense that I was ready to go and camera ready, as everybody says it. Um, but I wasn't prepared for the whole Hollywood, you know, you know sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. Yeah. Right. So some of the films, um, let's see here. There's a few that I had mentioned. Class of 1984. So that was filmed in 1982. Mm -hmm. In 1982 the new york market the los angeles market it was a very different animal than what it is today what were some of the things that you enjoyed while filming some of those films because you had a lot back to back to back at that same time mm -hmm. um and what are some of the things that you're kind of glad it has changed uh, what what i liked of course it's is that you're working and and so you you're self-supporting uh, what's hard is that in Canada at the time, it was really the, the wild, wild west. And in uh, unlike Hollywood, where it's been several generations of crew and unions with everyone's pretty well protected. Um, but we weren't uh, in, in those days as far as getting paid our uh, television rights, our VHS rights, our CD rights, our cable rights. And so essentially that whole generation of actors um, weren't paid for these ancillary rights. And what would happen is, and there was no way to recoup it because there was no assumption agreement that was created by the union, whereas SAG had that. It was yeah, actually it's part of the standard agreement with the uh, American film market, where if a producer sells the film to another entity, they, that entity has to assume the obligations of the original producer. Canada didn't have that. So there are people that did series and, 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 and movies and entire careers, 15 years, where you know, people are reusing their, their material and they, they didn't get paid. And that's what an actor relies on, especially in Canada, because in Canada, actors don't get unemployment insurance like in the United States. And so they really, really need that. And also actors, artists need to be paid um, for reuse of their work because when they get older, there's just not as much work. And so that kind of is their retirement for, you know, another word. So that that was really hard. And it, it's still hard for me to see that these films are so popular and, um, you know, they become cult films. And you know that the producers are getting paid and the actors aren't and 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 the directors and the writers and and so it's it, that kills the soul of an artist actually and um so that's one of the things i really did like about working in the united states and what i've always liked about americans because you know this country is founded on revolution and americans stand up for their for, for their rights mm -hmm. and and you know that's what i love about being a member of the screen actors guild is it's a very powerful union and and you really can't work anywhere in the world if you've 
of mistreated or not paid a Screen Actors Guild member because they're, they're, it's always an American Screen Actor member who's the lead in the film. So that that carries a lot of a lot of power. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. You know, that's really interesting what you were just mentioning there, where and that that sparks so many different questions in my mind that I've never explored. And possibly you probably do know the answer to this. So in other markets such as uh, London, do they have anything that would be relative to our union, to our guild? Yeah. So they have BAFTA, the British uh, uh, film and television uh, artists. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not a member of BAFTA, I don't know how they, they police things. I don't know how, well, you know, one of the wonderful things about the United States too is that they have a studio system and, and so Screen Actors Guild can track um, uses uh, of your material uh, through, through the studio systems. Uh, where you do get into trouble here is in, you know, SAG has told the members, you, we don't want you doing films abroad unless it's under global rule one, which is it's under uh, the, the, the ratified Screen Actors Guild uh, um, agreement. Otherwise, you're, you're not protected. I mean, I, I'm in somebody's like a network twice now has reused footage of mine and taken my headshot. And it's now on Netflix and I've had to go after them. That wouldn't happen if I had a Screen Actors Guild contract and, and that, that I have to pursue that. Um, so again, I, I just loved when I came and I became a member of the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> I, <laughs> because I just feel that I, I, I'm protected and some people are, 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 are anti-union, but in my experience, it's been a good thing to protect the artist. Absolutely. I do agree with you 100%. Um, for some of the horror films, what would be your favorite film that you were in? And who helped shape you the most between horror films and all of those that you had done and, and possibly in any other television show or you know, who are some of the people that you can name say, you know what, they made a lasting impression? So actually, I was discovered by Claude Chabrol, who was the Hitchcock of French cinema. And I did a film, my first film with him was opposite, uh, you know, I starred opposite Donald Sutherland and David Hemmings. And, uh, and there were a lot of great, you know, European actors in, in, in that film, like Donald Pleasance, like, you know, you, you saw him in Halloween. Um, you know, Stéphane Audran was, is it was, she's passed away now, I, but, I, but she was this great French actress. And then I went on to do a second film with Claude Chabot in French, in France, opposite Isabelle Huppert. And she's, she's the Meryl Streep of France. So that's, I was groomed with, really with European actors. And so they, they really uh, had an impact on me that, that, that about the discipline and that it's a profession and that you you have a respect in the way you you treat people on set and the way you behave then i went on to make american films with american stars where there's there was a lot of bad behavior you know because there's that whole star thing that some actors have and some don't and and those people when they act up and are difficult to work with and you know sorry i'm not coming to the set because my trailer isn't three inches closer than the other actors or you know that it's, it's the whole sex drug and rock and roll or you know give me cue cards know my lines that you just don't do that your right. European actors just don't do that and and so that was so interesting for me to observe um what really impacted me when i look back very greatly is much in the, in my early career people didn't cross over you either did film or you did television and not mm -hmm. until the advent of Michael Fox crossing over from three, uh, what's, what's the, oh, um, yeah, I know, I know, uh, I know, I know. The wrong name is coming to my mind. Different strokes <laughs> is not it. Okay. Um, and home improvement is not it. His name is not it. How many syllables? So anyway, <laughs> we all know what we're talking about, right? Okay. Yes. Sounds like how many syllables? And he he got Back to the Future, and he wasn't the first one cast, as we all know too. And then that changed everything. Same with John Travolta; he's the only other person to cross over because at that time, you're either a film actor or a television actor. So I turned down a bunch of television offers. A bunch, and, and later on, it that hurt me in my career because then, with the advent of pre-sales and in video cassette release, 
people would do pre-sales based on somebody's TVQ and I had none. But anyway, invariably I had actors that were my co-stars that were stars in films like Michael Fox, right, in the class of 1984, or like Jeffrey Tambor in The Man He Wasn't There, or, you know, um, it, you know, like so many actors. And they would inevitably turn to me and they'd say, Lisa, if you can ever avoid it, don't ever do any television because you have no life and you can't get into film. And you have, you know, you're working really, really long hours. And then on your off time, you're not getting time to spend with your family because you've got to go and do all this PR stuff for the networks. And so I put on the brakes. I, I never wanted to do television because my, my whole thing was family's more important. And I, I thought, gee, I, I really want to have a family and I really want to have kids and I want to be there for my kids. So I put on the brakes and that, that actually really hurt me. But, you know, there's a, there's a reason for everything. I mean, Angie Dickinson, ever, like, you know, because she was policewoman or whatever that series was. And they invariably turned to me. And another person, like, God, I'd have to go through all my films because there was always one person that had a big influence. I mean, Tony Curtis, you know, he was a movie star. He was like, like along with Elizabeth Taylor and all those people, they were those me. And he taught me so much. And, you know, at the time, you know, here's a guy that they, they've always made fun of him when he was, you know, Anthony Schwartz and he had that accent, you know, when, you know, the Brooklyn accent when he was playing in that other film we can't remember right now, or, <laughs> you know, the, the Trojan one where, where, you know, you know, they're hearing the sirens. What was that? Anyway, <laughs> I remember him saying to me very kindly, I think a speech coach would be good for you. And because I, you know, I had a very heavy Canadian accent and I couldn't hear it. And he taught me how to, you know, steal scenes. Like he'd say, Whatever you do, Lisa, when you're on the phone, make sure that you're talking while you're dialing. Because if you're just dialing, they're going to cut away from you. And, and or he'd, he'd tell me other things like, well, you know, whatever you do, whenever you're traveling internationally, always claim exactly what's in your suitcase, what you're bringing with you. It's really not worth it. Or he'd say, whatever you do, Lisa, when you, when you arrive at the hotel on a film, tip the, give a big tip to the person on the way in, tip your driver, give them gifts. And, and he also just talked to me about so many other things because he's, he was not only a great actor, he was an equestrian and a, and a, and a swimmer, and he, he was a great writer and, a, and, a, and an artist. I mean, you know, we're in the middle of the desert, and he invites me to, into his, his trailer, and there's nothing to do out there. And he says, look at the sculptures I've made. And he'd taken these, there was nothing to do, right? So we're all bored. And so, he, he, you know, this is before Wi-Fi and Internet and cell phones. So, you know, you're super bored, you know, while you're waiting. And he'd taken all these wire hangers and made these sculptures. And um, so, yeah, I taught, he, 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 he taught me a lot. And I'd have to go through all my films to go through. And then you, what you'd also learn is from people's, they, they unwittingly teach you things in, in their bad behavior and the way they treat people mm -hmm. badly. And, and, you know, when I was younger, I was the good Canadian and I, I never, reveal things but now i do I, I say who it was and 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 because how how, how are we not get, you know gonna learn why, why are we protecting these people for bad behavior <laughs> what well why are we protecting them yeah. you know i have to say i love how there's more respect for women on set where, you know, it was honey could you go get me this sweetie go sit over there oh you know you got a beautiful smile. I'm going to call you this, or I'm going to call you that. And they wouldn't call you by your real name. <laughs> I know. You I know. know. Can you imagine? And it's just, it's, it's just what's the way of the world. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, it's sad because that's the way those people were socialized too. Those right. men were socialized. And I've been socialized like that as an actress. And I've spoken about this at, at different uh, film festival where I hear speakers and you know about this whole thing about having women's voices and women directors and everything and and so I got to tell you you know because I haven't I ha I remember the first time I worked with a women director because women are very collaborative whereas men it's it's very hierarchical and and men you know they 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 keep everything inside so they don't you can't really tell that they're debating things and everything else whereas women are they'll, they'll say what do you think you know and they they huddle and they go into things and so. So that can be interpreted by, by a generation or generations of people who've been on sets with men who have socialized us to, to understand that directing is one way that we look at collaboration and people asking for other people's um, 
uh, you know, input as a weakness rather than a strength. That collaboration is a strength, mm -hmm. and and so I've I've spoken to people about that. That you better you better learn to to communicate with your actors, and and the actors better learn that there's certainly a different voice the way a man directs you and the way a woman directs you, and equally like the the whole crew is normally male. So when this woman is being collaborative, they're all like. In their body language, I see it. Mm -hmm. I see it all the time. And you know, where a woman will come and hug somebody, or they'll they'll do a huddle to say, "Okay, let's think about let's have a quiet moment here." That would be considered. That it's just not part. Like the EQ is so different between men and women, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, men are reared with you know contact sports, so that so they're reared with you know to come up to somebody and what's your problem, buddy, and getting right in their face. You know, and women play with dolls, and so they get psychological and how you feeling and everything. And so, so when you're on a set, and somebody's asking you to, you know, like, you know, get, you know, directors just talk to you differently. And I, I, I had this epiphany when I was workshopping actually this, this play that was based on this novel, that I just had to have a female director because the director. Was I'd read the book and I was going to be producing the movie and you know I I had been a victim of uh, uh, of uh, sexual abuse and this is about a a woman who became a very famous uh, journalist and, and writer mm -hmm. and here's a director you know, telling this it was like you know three generations on stage playing the woman at three different ages and telling us how we should be talking to our husbands boyfriends or how we should be responding and I I knew that. Never in a million years would a woman respond that way. Mm -hmm. And so then it occurred to me, wait, my whole career, I've had men writers telling me how a woman would say something. <laughs> the director telling me how a woman would say something, that male producers trying to say to how a woman would dress, how their hair and makeup would be. And it, it first occurred to me, the first kind of little red flag came up is when I was doing this movie of Steve Gutenberg called The Man He Wasn't There. That's where I hung out with Jeffrey Tambor, and he had said, whatever you do, don't ever do a series. And he so want, he wanted to be in movies. And I remember the director said we were in bed, and he goes, okay, when you wake up in the scene, I want you to roll over, and I want you to come on to Steve. He said, because that's a director's dream, a, a man's dream, and women never do that. So, again, that's setting the bar to how women are supposed to behave. Right. And and, and then, like, if you watch on Netflix, it's, I've watched it twice, and I, I keep telling everybody about it because I've learned so much that I just didn't know either. But Gina Davis's This Changes Everything and her foundation for women and how it's, you know, how Hollywood has rolled, no pun intended, about women's women's uh, images on the screen in cartoons for children and, 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 and like, the roles in production and how... They, the, there's actually been a movement that was like to keep women out of production and down. It, it was, it's fascinating. I, you know, it, it's, I, I can't believe this happened to us. <laughs> and, 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 and also to, to think that when I got into the business in 77, people said, Oh, you know, there's not going to be any work for you after 30. And I thought, well, that'll, right. be, that'll be different for me. That's like a long time away. <laughs> you know, and to hear that Maggie Gyllenhaal can't get cast opposite somebody that's 20, 30 years older than her because she looks too old opposite him. It's, we haven't, you know, there's been a little bit of movement, right? But I, I, I really don't think there can be great movement until, you know, there's equality in, in every department. And, you know, the, the second time I worked with a female director, I heard something again, and it, it was with Martha Coolidge who directed Valley Girl and she told this story and it was about casting and and um and how this came up is because she she wanted for her female lead she didn't want the you know the the blonde baby doll Barbie mm -hmm. and then she also talked about how in um you know in Valley Girl she wanted to cast Nicolas Cage and the, the studio said well we don't want to you know cast him he's just not attractive enough and she <laughs> said, knew he's not attractive because you're seeing it from a guy's point of view but from a woman's point of right. view He's really attractive. Right. So they look at all our who all our who our romantic leads have been supposed to have been for us women, and we're saying no, no that's that's we, we no we don't want the GQ look. That's not <laughs> appealing to us. But that's <laughs> the main thing that's appealing to us. Yeah.
Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. There's, I have in my notes that uh, you were on Murder She Wrote. Murder yeah. She Wrote. I loved it. I watched every single episode, and I would say, at that point in time, it was wonderful to see a female lead that was over forty. So Angela Lansbury was she was how old was she in her fifties? I would say in the beginning, and it ran for what about ten years. And it was it was fascinating. I love to see the the television shows that we watched every single week and the films that we watched that it's so obvious the whole crew is male and there's nothing wrong with that. But when women started to enter in as crew members, as directors, it took a just a very flat 180 and made it into a 360 view. It's like the diamond popped up and all of a sudden it's 360 and has all these facets and it has all this reality to it. I love that. So, so do I. It's so funny you mentioned Murder, She Wrote and then also the, the female thing because on, on, uh, on Murder, She Wrote, yes, it was Angela Lansbury and I wish at the time I'd researched it, but I was really young. I, I didn't take it seriously. Again, it was TV. It was something my mother watched. You know, and here I had no idea that, you know, who Robert Forster was. And he played my boyfriend. I'm like, it's like, oh, can I only do that again? But I was also going through like this, my first like really big breakup. And I it, I could care less. Like I was, I was doing my scenes and then, you know, going back to my trailer and throwing up. I was like so emotionally upset. But anyway, speaking of, you know, uh, of how they want women to look. So, yeah, we have Angela Lansbury. But me, I'm, I'm wearing the I Dream a Genie outfit. And they've stuffed my bra and everything else and and all my directions okay when we when you walk in the door i had to do this for several takes not because of my acting it's because i had to do something that women we don't walk into doors this way but it was simply to show my body and breasts it was like you know i was just walking in the door and i had to like walk in and stand like this and then walk <laughs> forward and i remember like yeah they stuffed me and everything else and i remember talking to this one crew member and he was he was having he, he he wasn't talking to my face his eyes kept going down and i thought okay you, you should know you know spoiler alert but these aren't real they've stuffed me mm -hmm. and this is what it must feel for women who are really big breasted that women men constantly can't they can't focus on your face i've never <laughs> experienced that before and so that was really funny and then on on chance for christmas it was my first time where all the ad's were women and here's where I had my first epiphany of how it's different and how I even respond differently when there's females or males. So I'm coming in, I'm checking one day to the set and going out and they, they rented out this like small, you know, really quaint uh, historic hotel. And so I had my roll on carry on. I was going to go up the stairs and the third AD who was checking me in, she said, oh, I'll carry that up for you. And I said, no, I can carry it. And I thought to myself, man, if that were a guy, I would never say no at all, carry it for myself. Not because I'm, I'm a, 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 a woman's liver, but I, I would feel embarrassed to say to him, no, I'm going to carry it myself. But for a woman, I would feel embarrassed for her carrying it for me. So I said, no, no, I'm going to carry it myself. I felt embarrassed when she said, I'll carry that for you. So again, it's really interesting about the communication and the perceptions and how it's all like changing like crazy. Um, it really is. And with those changes, the psychology, just like what you were oh. saying, psychology changes and, and just the normalcy of things, like everything is, is just riding this wave and we haven't seen it crest out yet. It's, uh, it's so fascinating. I'm excited for this time because women can be old on television and film like we're supposed to be i mean well, you know, i i heard that in england not here yet but in england you if you've had face work they won't cast you and i i think that's great because with all these you know i don't mind when people have face work if they admit to it like jane fonda but these other actresses that we know they've had face work they create this artificial bar for the world and 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 then what happens too is that you don't see any women on the screen from this age to this age that are look real. They, right. they have this art, like it, they, they, and so for, for the rest, it's, we're just really not doing our own women a favor because the every man in the world, the, the every woman, they're aspiring, they're thinking that they're less than because they don't look as good as 
these women and they can never look that as good as these women, never. And, and, and so I've made this commitment my, to myself to, to be, as I was started out like the Europeans and not get any work done. And believe me, sometimes it's really hard because I see mm -hmm. my contemporaries and I see what they look like. And it's also really hard because, um, you know, because of the media and, and, you know, comparing yourself and it's, it's really hard. So, you know, but I keep saying to myself, okay, just be like, just do the Hepburn thing, Catherine and Audrey Hepburn. If you can just keep your weight down, you can look good. It's when you get like really bloated looking from too much eating and drinking that then you look tragic. But if it, you know, Audrey and, and, and Catherine Hepburn didn't have any work done and they look great till the end. Because otherwise you start looking like an avatar or mm -hmm. Siamese cat. And, and, and it just, it looks tragic because, you know, when you can look across the room and look at, see somebody coming in and you see the face work from across the room, it's wow. So it's, it's really, it's, it, it's hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's, it is it's really hard. hard. Have you had any opinions from, I, I would hope not managers or agents or anyone like that, that have said anything like, you know, do you do facials? You know, maybe do you do- no, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I had it. I had it when I first started here. I was 22 years old and I had a very big wow. PR, PR representative and he he looked at my, my um, contact sheet and he went over what was wrong with my face. And he said, you need to start getting stuff done now because people do it in their early 20s here. And so that, you know, by the time you're 30, he said, you know, nobody already noticed. And it, it always looked like you just had a fresh haircut. And then he went over the different celebrities who, who did such a thing. And um, it all made sense to me. And it all looked like it just wasn't who I was. It just wasn't who I was. And, you know, including, you know, um, it's probably why I sabotaged my career so often. It was because I just didn't think I was going to be prepared to be who I needed to be to have that kind of success. I mean, you know, I get another great big manager one take me. They said, you, you better not ever go out of the house without any makeup on. And I just thought, you know, I, I'd rather spend that hour reading a book or <laughs> watching, doing something and, you know, like putting the makeup on and then having to take it all like that. It, like for me to get, what I'm looking like today, this is an hour and a half, okay? It's mm -hmm. wash and blow dry the hair. So like maybe a professional will do it in less time, 45 minutes. But for me, I have big, big hair, it's really thick, hour and a half, and then a half an hour to 45 minutes to get the makeup done. And then there's taking it off at night. And um, some people doesn't bother them. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Like I know, and, and, and so, yeah, you know, yeah. So, and it, but it's my job. It's my job. Well, you know, I really admire you for your personality. I would say I've been told that I have a strong personality. Lady. You do. That's what I like about you. Yeah. Big personality, and I'm like, sometimes that's code for obnoxious. So, what exactly are you trying to say? It's true. I had somebody say this to me before, and it was actually after you did an interview. And he said, "You know, are you? You know, I got to know you now." And he goes, "You know, some people because you're so outspoken." Would, would interpret that as arrogance. He said, but you're just really saying your opinion. It's really what you believe in. And I thought, oh yeah, that could sound like arrogant. I never thought of it that way, but I just want to be open, honest, and direct because I, I made this commitment to myself early in my, my life too. Because my mother used to say to me, you know, Lisa, I think a lot of reasons why a lot of women get involved in all this, these drugs is that they just don't like themselves in the morning. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I just want to like myself. So I thought, yeah, you have no control over the success in your career because that that means like the script that's going to be the hit and how many scripts are hit has to get to you you got to get cast in that script after maybe all these other people don't get it or turn it down right. so all you have control over in your life is being kind to others and having integrity so that's that's all i have control over so that's what i'm going to do absolutely and i admire that mm -hmm. in you i think there are so many young let's just talk about the young ladies that will truck out to hollywood and oh you know they're gonna make it this is this their dream they've taken a few classes at home and you know or possibly they've done a lot of work at home and now they should be in hollywood but it just seems like that bug bites all of them in today's world and you know they're they're 20 something and they're doing work and it's like 
I can understand aging gracefully. I do not have yes. a problem with anyone that wants to do a little whatever you want same to here, do. Same here. But please don't do it at 20, 25 years old. How, what do you think would be the key thing that someone who is coming out to Hollywood, they're in their 20s, they're young, they don't have, um, I like to call it grounding, but you know, children will ground you. Um, it, it can take a large personality and sometimes make you a little bit more realistic because you're just so flamboyant about life like I was um, and still am, but I feel grounded. Uh, what is some of the advice that you can give to them to say, no, wait, slow down. Don't run off to Beverly Hills to some of the best plastic surgeons. You don't need it. You know, that is such a tough one. Because as, as far as, you know, the, the lifestyle of no integrity, um, my core group of friends that I've known since elementary school just wouldn't have allowed it. I, I just would have, I would have been excommunicated from them and they're, they're too valuable to me. And same with my, my cousins and, you know, my, my brothers and my mom. But it, it's, it's, you know, I, I, it, it's really a hard one. It's, it's because the, the, the pressure is just so intense. I mean, there's nobody telling you to say no. Everybody's telling you to say yes to it. Everybody. And, you know, and, and even, even people that aren't in the business. I mean, you know, I, I have a friend that um, huge, I, I shouldn't say because somebody's going to see this and they're, they're going to know who it is, but they're, they're not in the business, not in the business. And she said, I, I want to get some face work done and she's not even in the business but she's really high like where she's succeeded in her profession i want to say profession because my friends could see this and we'll know who we're talking about and uh and there's such pressure for people outside the business because they, they have everything to offer because they have all this experience but they get gray listed and mm -hmm. and so they've got to look okay so they start getting work men are getting work so that in the conference room, in the boardrooms, they don't look tired. Like I know somebody, and that's what he did. He had to get it under his eyes done so he could look refreshed. Um, so he could, he could because he's opposite these young MBAs. And, you know, you, you get you get gray listed. And, and so there, there's just so much pressure. I mean, you know, you, you, you look at, at, at um, you know, first of all, for me, it's like, <laughs> who wants to do anything permanent because it's, you know, I don't like last year's hairstyles and clothing that I, I you know, and if, if somebody does something wrong and we've seen people who've had the most, the, you know, all the money that they have more money than God. So, and then they get bad work done. So I, I think, God, you know, they, they have all these, we're very close now. We know that aging is a disease. Okay. And they can reverse it. And we're, we're almost there like with gene editing and, and, you know, um, blood and, and everything we're, 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 we're so close and so I, I i would rather somebody do something like that than than go under the knife or do anything permanent like maybe yeah just just do maybe the injections but you know but like i i i i, I know somebody in toronto and and her lips look painful when she get it it's like i want to say man you you look like daffy duck <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's like beyond bee sting yeah. And, and uh, she's not even in the business, but she's, she's, she's in, you know, she's editorial fashion and, and, you know, she's got a boyfriend who's encouraging her to get, cause she's had two children to get breast implants. And um, it's just, wow. It, it, it's, it's really something that we have to address, but what, what, what are we, what actors, what, what roles are we going to be playing if we only are looking if we're only playing parts where we're manufactured. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so when you see Francis, Francis McDormand, it's, it looks so great. Or Kate Winslet, you know, the way she looks on the, the you know, the, the, you know, and that's scary for me to let myself go like that. And I've gotten pictures taken like that and everything else. My agent goes, oh, I don't know whether you want anybody to see this. Says, yeah, but those are the kind of roles I want. Right. Those are the kind of roles I want. Because um, you, you just want to, you don't want to turn into that tragic person that, you know, they see themselves by the reflection in other people's eyes, mm -hmm. of how they feel. And, and um, yeah. And, and so for me to have role models like Kate Winslet, where it's, a, you know, where she's, she's natural. She, 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 she let her, she's, she's got 
natural size hips and everything else. But that takes a lot of courage because in Hollywood and, sure. you know, it's even in the dating world, we, we, the expectations that people have. I mean, people are like are changing like their selfies. They, they, they have filters and they can self edit like to eat. To, you know, I have friends that are laymen and mm -hmm. they're fixing themselves. And I look at it and I go, God, like I'm not even like you, you're not even the business. Like I, I have to do that because I'm an actor. But in real life, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, it is so refreshing yet again to see that we're man, the starvation of trying to be that perfect size too. And you know, then I, my mother was always very self-conscious of, of being, she wanted to be the smallest. So it was the starvation diets, the crash dieting. None of it works. None of it's healthy, but it's, oh, you got to be small. You got to be small. And now we have some people in film and television that are normal shapes. They're, they're shapes. <laughs> you know? It's really nice to see some shapes. And I love that for my girls who are in their yes. 20s and who are teenagers. And it's like, yes, you know, God blessed you with with hips and thighs and like you're shapely. There's nothing you can do about it. Trust me. I was a teenager in the early 90s and starved myself to be to be tiny, tiny. And, and surely you are, but you're starving yourself. It's not healthy. Um all right, so I want to talk I just, about. I just can say one thing about that is I have a friend, Monica Parker. She wrote a book called Wasted, W A I S T E D. And it's all about every starvation diet she ever tried. And I told her, I said, you know, when I was reading your book, I just wanted you to die. It was just so painful to see what you went through to just get smaller over and over again. Yeah. Right. I'm putting that up to the screen, everybody. So the book is called Wasted. Yes, I would agree with you. And and it's, I, I have read a little bit of this book, but I mean, it's so true. It is just so true. And it's psychological because you let society get into your mind, poison your mind, which then your integrity is shot. Your self-worth is shot. And you're just going to do what you feel like you're, you know, you become like a robot. You're programmed to do this. You have to look like everybody else. Um, family Ties. That's the name of the show. Family <laughs> Ties. <laughs> All right. So I you know, know, that's because we just popped one of those neural mints, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So focus I mean, I, you know, I, I'm going out to get those tonight because there's so many applications I have for those. Like when you're on a night shoot, yeah. just stuff like that. Or you just, like you said, you just want that little, because I was telling like Carlos, I was telling him the other day, because he said, oh, you know, after we go for dinner, can we go back to your place and have a cup of coffee? I said, I can't have caffeine after four o'clock. I'll be up all night. He goes, oh, that's from my old crime reporter days. But there are just some times where you just need a little bit. And that's fantastic. And it's a breath mint too. Bonus. Yeah. It's a breath mint too, and it's only half a cup of coffee. So in a few hours, it has already worn itself off and they clean source it. So I'm not sure. I have to look it up again exactly what their source is. A lot of times it's green coffee beans. Um, that is a nice natural source. It's not bitter and it doesn't give you that headache. Anyway, neuro mint, you got to get it. Um, <laughs> I know, I've got to get it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's talk about the project, A Chance for Christmas, which is, is it an episodic that's streaming? No, no, it's a, it's a dysfunctional Christmas movie. And it's that's amazing. what I love about it. Cause I always say to people, you know, I come from a dysfunctional family and picking out greeting cards is really hard because nothing is correct. So, you know, Cause it's always, oh, for all those wonderful times we had for all those great things that we did together. So this is a just functional Christmas movie, which I thought was just tremendous. And um, I, I, because of the way I started out, because it's so easy to get, you know, typecast, I was always cast in drama, always. Like I did like one comedy that was a Steve Gutenberg thing and also the Martha Coolidge thing, but always, that was my brand, right? So flash forward all these years, I get this audition and they want a, a cross between Dolly Parton and Kim Cattrall with Sex and the City. 
So I said to my agent, that's really interesting. I said, because I auditioned for Kim Cattrall's role, actually. I actually said, no, no, I don't think I should go out for that. I think I should go out for the Kristen Davis part. Because I, I, I had such low self-esteem. I could never see myself as, you know, that that other role. Anyway, um, and I got a funny story to tell you about that, too, because that's about the perception. So mm -hmm. uh, it was to play the part of a lawyer, right? These lawyers in New York. And so I go in and I, I wear, a, you know, what? I know lawyers wear, you know, like the lower skirt, you know, and uh, jacket and some low heels and everything. And, and I don't even get a call back. So, so I'm in, I go to my acting class and I see this girl come in and really great girl, but she's just wasn't a great actress at all. Beautiful. And, but she'd gotten a call back and she'd just come from a call back and she had like the mini skirt almost up to her rear end. And that was an epiphany for me. I just thought, Oh, you're not supposed to really dress and wear makeup and hair like a real lawyer. So that was an epiphany for me. So anyway, uh, on this part here, yeah, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do the big, so I did the big hair like Dolly Parton, and I really just let it go, and I had a great time, and Stefan Brogren, the director, was so amazing. The cast was amazing. He really knew what he was doing. Um, you know, and it was it was in this beautiful little town outside of Ottawa, Canada called Elmont, where apparently they shoot a lot of these uh, Hallmark movies because it's just magical. And uh, sometimes it got really hard because, you know, we're shooting outside at night. And because I've lived here so long, I, you know, I, you know, I've forgotten how cold <laughs> things can be. You know, it, you, you see cold and you, it's like nothing like experiencing cold where you're you like at one point. You know, they, they give you those those heaters. They you know those things that you wear uh, with inside your mitts and stuff like that. Where they put them in your in your shoes. And at one point, though, we're I had you know I didn't have winter boots on. I had these really funny seventy type boots that were really right for the character. They were like green snakeskin and they were platform, but they're like vinyl, right? So they they freeze in the cold. And, they, and so I almost got frostbite. Like the <laughs> yeah first. Uh, uh, like the medic had to take my shoes off. They had to put blow dryers on my 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 toes, and he said, "Yeah, you're. It looks like you're going to get frostbite here." And um, yeah, that was that was interesting. <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah, oh my and, and I, I played a cougar for the first time. Did and you I, like it? I did. I did. I, I actually really did because um, it was refreshing. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. he was such a great actor, and he was so much fun. And it's so interesting because you never know how people are going to perceive you or so it, until you get to know somebody. So he was, he's this guy that he, he, he doesn't talk a lot until you get to know him. So it was hard at, for me at first because, you know, he, we're supposed to be romantic together and he didn't say much, but the, the, the icebreaker was, you know, he, he wasn't saying much to me. And he said, was that Michael J. Fox that you worked with? How was that? <laughs> And I, and I'm so just used to because because I work with him that you don't, you don't even think of it you don't even you know uh, it, it's like because when you're an actor you're, you're you're just doing your job it's like so so many women have said to me oh my god he was Sam Elliott he was this close to your face and you don't notice it because you're just doing your job you're thinking what the character's thinking like so people say well what was he like to work with so you got to think about it it's like okay yeah because you're not thinking right about that yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, chance for Christmas. Uh, what I liked about it too, is they had a mixed race couple too. I thought that was very interesting. So he was, he was, I don't know whether, I think he, I don't know his hair. I don't think he was African American. I think he might've been say from the Caribbean, but you know, he was Canadian. Um, of course, cause we don't have African Americans in, in Canada unless they've moved. Um, and then, and then the the actress, uh, he, the the director said he really wanted her because it was a ton of dialogue, and we had, were really short on on schedule. And he said, I just knew she could deliver. And he said, and she was just wonderful. I I said to the director, she's like a young Catherine Hepburn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, these two young kids, you know, I should have put the credits in front of me because do you think along with the Michael Fox thing, I you know, I'm I'm, I'm having a, a hard time remembering their their names. And then again, like these, all these female people on the crew, and they were so good. And it was my first COVID project where everybody's masked. And um, also I had a kiss. So that was really scary for me to tell you the truth. And it brought me back for me all, all my first kiss during the AIDS crisis that, mm -hmm. you know, AIDS came out. They didn't know how it was going to be, you know, communicated. So every, like, so I did this movie with Steve Gutenberg, right, with Jeffrey Tambor. Mm -hmm. 
and you're looking at the other person and, and it was the times where SAG was starting, they, they, it, they didn't yet have rulings on how kissing was going to be handled with AIDS. And I remember having the same kind of trepidation when I was going to have to kiss this guy because of the COVID thing going on. So mm -hmm. they, they did have rules. What you had to do is they had this, <coughs> they had, you, so you take off your mask when they were about to roll and then they have this mouthwash that has bleach in it, I guess, like, you know, those white teeth whitening things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have to swish it around your mouth for maybe, I think it's 30 seconds. And then, and then you spit it out and then you have to, then you take something else. Maybe it was Listerine. It was something else. Like, and then you, you gargle and then they roll and you kiss. But at the same time, while I'm doing all this, I'm, what's going on in my mind is, are we going to find out later that we were really wrong and this was this was not handled right? Because this happens a lot in film. We're in the in, in the days of the wild wild west before you know people know we shouldn't have been doing this. Like yeah. when, when people weren't wearing seat belts and carrying their children on their laps in the front seat of the car, right? <laughs> um, are we going to? Am I going to look back at this and say? Oh, it, it's no wonder you, you caught COVID because that was not safe what you did. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't want to look like an idiot. So needless to say, I did not get COVID, but I, I had trepidation and it was so interesting because the, the actor, he said, I'm okay. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I even said to the director, I saw it in the script, but I, I thought because of COVID that they weren't really going to do it. And I said, oh, are we actually really doing this? And he said, yeah, didn't anybody have a conversation with you about it? And I said, no. Very interesting. You know, I wonder how they came down to that methodology to yeah. say, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. And then it's good. It's totally good. Did they come down with this methodology? Who thought right. that? Up, right? right. What meeting were they in where they're like, no, 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 we're, we're going to gargle. And then, then we're going to gargle a second time. And then as long as they kiss within a certain amount of seconds, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like what they have now too, and this is good. And I've listened to a couple of, of seminars on this, but they have the intimacy coordinators now for the, you know, the intimate scenes. Mm -hmm. And I find that really interesting um, and helpful because lots of times too, because you're the old, you know, back in the day before there were females on sets, you were the only woman. Okay. Cause you, you it's your male lead. And then the entire set, 80 to 120 people are males, okay? Yep. So when you say, I don't feel comfortable doing that, the pressure is really intense. So to have an intimacy coordinator now where it's saying we're gonna do A, B, C, and D, and it's gonna be just like a fight scene, like, or it's choreographed, like a fight scene, mm -hmm. it's choreographed for, so it doesn't, it, it's nothing gets done where you don't feel comfortable. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a whole lot to think about. I mean, those scenes are not easy to begin with. No, no. <laughs> and they look great, but there is nothing really sexy about a sex scene. Not at all. Not at all. And all these people are watching you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, right. but again, I started out in Europe, and there, um, you know, just like people are brought up with nudity like they are drinking wine at the table mm -hmm. you know and and so when that happens people don't exploit things the same way it doesn't become salacious and 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 so you know there so when i got exploited it's because i come off come out of that environment thinking that the environment on my first film i was required to take off my clothes would be the same and i ended up being totally exploited Oh. So again, that kills your soul as an artist because yeah. you had trust and you were operating in good faith. And then you realize that, no, you were just being exploited for that market. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That happened to so many. So yeah. many. I, I want to talk about the novel that you are adapting into a film project mm -hmm. and it shines a light on the Me Too movement. What can you tell us about that? Okay, so, <clears throat> we, we, you know, we we all know about the Me Too movement, and I think all of us wish it happened earlier in our lives because we would have been more prepared to really speak up when something was inappropriate and also recognize when things were appropriate. I mean, I, 
you know, we, we there's actually codes of behavior now that we get cards for. I haven't gotten it through Screen Actors Guild, but I've got it through Canada. They're placed all, all over sets where it's a code of behavior where there are things that, again, we were just socialized that way, that it was okay for men to do that. We, you know, and now we're learning that, no, 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 it's not okay, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, so this book is a true story about this woman in, in Canada who was the the victim of, of sexual abuse from her her father and actually to be a survivor she she was like the early sybil um she she buried it and you know had this alter personality and then at 40 had a stream of consciousness and she just wrote these wrote two novels one about her childhood one from when she went to high school into her adult years and and everything that happened to her and it's pretty much a long story but it's pretty much destined that it was supposed to come to me because um it took place on the street that I went to school on. And, and uh, you know, I, I was a, a survivor as well. And it's just, it's just incredible. And, and how this property came to me Now it's going to be an art house picture. And it's, it's hard because once again, you know, it's uh, not an action picture. And they say that people don't want to see these things, but they might not want to go to the movies to see these things. Cause everybody's these, these victims one in three, by the way, hmm. Are, tr are triggered but man though i think that they'll watch it at home where they have control over it and they go i can't take this i'm going to turn it off and i'll go watch it again they will they will so the timing is right and 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 uh, there's there's more of a dialogue for that now because before people they didn't want to believe those little girls and those little boys they and and i used to say well what why would they make that up because <laughs> it's really you feel shame as it is you know carrying it around let alone you know voicing it so yeah, I just finished adapting it uh, with, with the author, and you know, I'd done an initial adaptation. The author said it was the best adaptation that anybody had ever done, and then so she's come on board now to tweak it. And it, it was hard because you know, when it's a whole novel, you have to cut out a lot to get it down to a uh, feature film, and it, it'll be going out this week to a female producer. And I'm I'm really trying to. You know, and I hate saying this because an artist is an artist is an artist is an artist that I don't want to have people involved just because of their gender. But again, when I had that epiphany doing the play where I thought, wow, for 40 years I've had men decide how my character should dress and the makeup they should wear and the hair and how they should behave in a sex scene or in a relationship. And I, wouldn't it be great that the female voice could come forward. And I can't say it enough to people. Just watch Gina Davis's documentary called This Changes Everything on Netflix because it all addresses how we've all had this filter about how we've been perceiving women that, you know, she started, she, she, the stu she'd go to the studios and they, they, they didn't even know the statistics. But she started watching these things with her daughter and she would just see that all the images of the, the little girls looked at it where the girls were just the princesses and then the images are, are the boys are people who are very proactive and I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be an engineer. And, and so it was all men, little boys had images of the cartoon characters that were very goal oriented and mm -hmm. um, self motivated and taking care of themselves. And the other, the women, the, the images the little girls got to look at, they're all princesses and it's like, Oh, let's mm -hmm. wait for the white horse to come and save me. And I don't need to have a career. I could just, a Prince Charming will save me. And it's, it's really contaminated uh, our, our involvement as, as women and also as men and how, how they perceive our role in the world. Um, and then, we, we, I mean, I, I had no idea how women were suppressed in the film industry in, in, in production mm -hmm. and as executives, that it was actually, it was actually, it wasn't even a secret, right? letting women be executives in the, in the industry. And it's been going on since the beginning of time. And so it's hard because, you know, it, it was a great club. And, I, you know, I worked with Hal Ashby and, and I remember him saying he just feels so lucky that he was born white, male and in the Western world. I love that about him. At least he was copying to it. Right, right. You know, there are so many men that feel... Um, a little lost in what can they do? What can they not do? And, and I do remember a couple of years ago, you know, when we were first hearing about the Me Too movement as it was developing as a movement, 
And I was at the gym one day and this, this older man, he was probably close to 80. He, every morning he would come up and say, oh, you look beautiful today. Have a great day. <laughs> and he came up to me, and said, is it okay if I compliment you? Aww. And I said, yes, of course it's okay to compliment. Of course it's okay to be a gentleman. Of course it's okay to open a door, to, to also expect in return a thank you for yes. your, your gesture. And I have heard that from more men that will ask, what's okay? I'm so lost. <laughs> It, it, it's true. It, it, and, 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 you know, well, there'll be, there'll be some balance and they, you know, there, there's just going to be an, you know, kind of a, an etiquette that everyone's going to have to, going to have to, to, to learn that we did swing too far the other way. I mean, we, we just had, you know, look, look at even, you know, we've had this whole film language telling men how to behave, like, you know, just grab the woman. And even if she doesn't like it, just hold on to her and keep kissing her. And eventually she'll go, like in Gone with the Wind and, and Clark Gable. And so they, they've been told to behave that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they just have to, you know, the, the, they'll learn other ways. And so will we, you know, I'm sure, you know, one of the things that gets me down is like, I, I just can't stand the F-bomb. Like I walk down the street and everybody's talking so loudly and you're swearing like crazy, the F-bomb, wherever you are. And I want to say, can't you just like leave that inside your house? It's, it, it's, it's like verbal pollution for me. Yeah. You know, like that's just such bad manners. I just, it does get me down that there are no manners in the world anymore. Mm -hmm. It gets me down. Yes, I agree. I, I think putting a video camera in everybody's hands is, is not exactly the best thing. You know, we are seeing everything. Um, and it's so easy to have these iPhones, to have these Android phones. They all have video capabilities. And now we have social media so you can, in an instant, upload anything and everything you want. And for my mother, who um, and she's in her 80s and she's a lovely woman, but being the age that she is, she comes from a completely different generation. And I have to remind her saying, mom, it's okay, calm down. You know, the world is not too much crazier than it was years and years and years ago. But today we're seeing everything. We're seeing it all. Every thought, every and your kids truth. are. It, yeah. it's, that's what bothers me is that, uh, Young kids, they're they're exposed to pornography so young, and and yeah. so that's their their lesson in how intimacy should be, and it's just so incorrect. Yeah, yeah I and agree. young boys are being taught that, gee, that's the way you you're intimate with women, and that's in just in it's so sad, so sad. It so is sad for the boys and 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 for the girls. And it's so confusing. You know, they wind up getting involved in situations and things that they had no business getting involved in. Right. Um, and my goodness, they they can get into situations where they grow up just like that and their childhood's over. And it's like, oh, the childhood is the magic moment of life. I know. Yeah. It should be. Like family <laughs> ties, right? Family ties. Family ties. That's right. Absolutely. Well, I love, and I do want to come back to, and it's a chance for Christmas, correct? Yeah, it on is. TV. And, and so that's a free st uh, streaming service. It is free, but not free because there's commercials. But I hadn't heard of it before. And uh, so I, it, you know, it was great. And it's, yeah, it's a dysfunctional Christmas movie. Ergo, um, I, I'm dating this guy who is my daughter's uh, you know, uh, he, he went to school with my daughter and uh, my ex-husband hangs out at the house. We all hang out together. Um, yeah, it's, and, and then and then my daughter has her two kids and, and they talk to her in a certain way that's very dysfunctional, but we all love one another. And it's 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 a Christmas movie. And, and so there's this, the whole thing about the magic of Christmas and how, how miracles can happen. I love it. Can we take a watch of the trailer? Do you mind? Yeah, let's do that. I don't. Am I in the trailer? Let's take a look. All right, let's take a look. Christmas comes but once a year, or does it? 
<sighs> wakey, wakey. And don't, don't forget, forget to like and subscribe. If you get 2 million engagements, you become the new face of Love Handles. Christmas Eve is the biggest day of my career. It's a time for family. Look, look, it's beginning to snow. It's so cold. For big, the Love Handles mixer makes mixing go easier. For decorating. Oh. I am going to lose my job because of this. I wish we could just do the day over again and get what we need. Careful. Christmas wishes have a way of coming true. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell. It's a time for family. Wakey! For baking, for decorating. Family, baking, decorating. Oh no. Don't you get it? We are groundhogging it. A two be original. What would you say if I told you that Doug and I have been cursed by Santa Claus to relive Christmas Eve over and over and over again? Nope. Dang, no. One, One Christmas. Christmas. That stupid Tony old man is about to throw her life for a loop. <laughs> oh, oh. A chance for Christmas. Christmas trees represent the families that decorate them. Well, then we should set ours on fire. Streaming free on June 18th. Oh, that's wonderful. I love and, it. That, that is, and, what's, and what's great about the dysfunction is you notice they released it in the summertime instead of at Christmas. So, yeah, it's like it, I forgot to mention about the Groundhog Day aspect of it, too. Yeah. That makes it so fantastic. There are so many different Christmas films out there, but I love the Groundhog Day aspect to it. Oh, my goodness. I, I do love Christmas. I really do. But at my household, my husband loves to do the synchronized lights and these like 40 foot Christmas trees that he's crafted. On. I mean, it looks like Whoville. It grew <laughs> up in my front yard. It really does. And I thought the first year he told me, you know, I'd like to do this. We were actually separated and living together. And yeah. I was filming and I was filming overnights. So as I would come home, yeah, oh gosh, so exhausted. And I'm coming home at like 5.30 in the morning. I've been working all night long and I've got the kids during the day in this house. And, 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 and no neural mints. What's that? No neural mints. Yes, no neural mints. And my house is like twitch, twitching as I'm coming down. The, and I'm like, I don't like this. I can't handle this. It's too much. <laughs> That, that, that's a horror film, actually. That's a, a Christmas horror film. <laughs> it really, it really is. It really, no, oh, sorry. It's a, it's a Christmas psychological thriller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love what we just watched because that is a film for the entire family. It so, is. you know, there are some people out there that still have their Christmas trees up. They're still in the Christmas spirit because it, it let's see, tomorrow it will be one month ago was Christmas. Um, Amazing. So. I know it is. It goes just like that, doesn't it? But you can check out A Chance for Christmas streaming on Tubi. Thank you so much, Lisa. This has been really delightful to get to know you. Likewise. Yeah, you're yeah. really good interviewing and, and, and you know your stuff. Oh, and you don't you just ask the normal questions and, and it becomes a conversation instead of an interview. So I have a good time. Good. I'm glad that you had a good time. I really had a great time. I would love to leave. Oh, we're going to talk about Lemonade Stand. Oh, oh, tell me about it. Let's go. That's the movie. It has, it's going to come out in August, and mm -hmm. it's, it's my first Hallmark movie. And um, this one I'm playing a mom, not a cougar. And it's about this 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 woman who runs this um, big um, uh, marketing company, and there's a lawsuit uh, because somebody, you know, there's always somebody like this uh, says it's this – little kid in her hometown um, can't have a lemonade stand without uh, a license. So she comes home to set those those things right. And of course, she runs into the hometown um, high school sweetheart and Kel Surprise. They get reunited. But it was it was a really sweet movie. It was, it's really sweet as well. Yeah. And the cast was delightful. And the director was so, so cute and energetic. And it was something I'd never done before because he was really into experimentation because he's also the writer of the script. So he'd say, okay, I want you to do it completely different from the way it's written. So, you know, that that's a challenge because once you're cast, 
you 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 say, well, okay, I'm gonna solidify what I did because they obviously like what I did for the audition. So then you get there and you say, no, no, throw that out the window. We don't want you doing that at all. And you know, I'm locked for several weeks thinking about the character, how the character perceives those things. And and he had me doing it several different times in different ways. Yeah. So that I'm 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 interested to see you know what my performance is how it what what, what which direction he went with it yeah oh i love it i'm sure i, mean, I love working with him because he he's one of those guys that because he comes from independent film making that he, he'll just get down on his hands and knees and you know do what he has to do you know to to save time and um he already knows what he wants because he's i can see he's editing in his head and for me, that that's when it's a real luxury is when an, uh, a director really knows what they want instead of the ones they're saying, you know, I just, just don't know, you know, because because it you know, time is money, and and if it's a big production, it doesn't matter. But when the clock is ticking, so I, I he really knew what he wanted, and uh, had a lot of energy and was funny, and yeah, it was it was a very good experience, and it was summertime this time, not winter. And so it's um, it's slated to come out this summer, 2022? August. August. Yeah. Okay, I'm putting that on the screen so everybody can go take a look. It is called Lemonade Stand on Hallmark. Another wonderful gather the family and watch type of, of broadcast. I mean, that is, I love that. You know, well, just, just like nobody wanted to do TV early on in my career, they did a TV, but now what I just read is that these Hallmark movies and Lifetime are becoming very trendy because they know that people are getting together as families and they're binge watching, they're loving them. So now it's kind of become this thing that, for example, you know, Brooke Shields just did one for a lark. And then there was somebody else who just did one. Was it uh, a huge star a woman? And I thought that is so cool that they're saying, yeah, I'm going to do one of these. What the heck? You know, it's, it's a family. Yeah. It is, you know, there's so many times when, I mean, my kids are, the youngest one is 10 and the oldest, they're in their 20s, but the ones that are still at home, you know, they all have their tablets. They all have, they they need them for school. So that was sort of the caveat, right? So they, they got it. And now they watch YouTube kids and stuff. And it's like, it, it's sad the moments when I see everybody going in a different direction. They're all watching their their content. So these types of moments where you can sit down and you can watch Lemonade Stand, you can watch A Chance for Christmas with the whole family and just say, come here, just cuddle and let's watch something together. It's so nice. It's so refreshing. That's how TV used to be. We'd, you know, if, if you're a baby Hi. of thousands, you don't know what Thursday nights was. Yes, yes, yes you're right. And I never thought of that because I only had one son and that must feel really painful to see people going off in different directions, especially if you knew another way that right. families were when they all watched it together. Wow. Yes. Yes. In my family, we had um, a TV and, and it wasn't really a living room. It was like the television room. It, it was the, you know, the yeah. TV and, and TV room. And we'd all gather in there and I would watch the Muppet show and so would my older sibling, who was almost 10 years older than me, and my mom and dad, and we're all sitting there watching The Muppet Show, you know? It was great a great that. time. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So I love this. Thank you so much. Keep Thank doing it. Thank you so doing. much, yeah. You're okay. very welcome. Well, you know, if you ever come to, I'm in Los Angeles right now in Santa Monica, but if you ever come to Toronto, you have my contact information. Thank you. We can have a play date. We can have a play date. We could have a play date and I would love that. I love <laughs> Canada. I haven't been to Canada in a very long time. I think I was, oh gosh, I was probably still living at home and we went to Quebec. Oh, wow. Best, best experience ever. Did you go to Quebec City or Montreal? And we went to Quebec City and then my father took to the roads and we traveled into the country and um, he said, now they don't speak English, so you need to learn French. So I did. I took a couple of months before we left. I learned French. And so I was speaking and ordering at restaurants. And, you know, they did Good not. Good for your dad. Wow. And, yeah, we, we would stop at like a bed and breakfast. And oh, I, wow. That is so magical. And I love how you said, 
And my father took to the road. <laughs> <laughs> he did. We went exploring. It was a wonderful time. So I'd love, love to come back. Yeah, you'll have to go back. Yeah. I would love to. I'd love to. Well, this has been really, really nice, Lisa. Thank you thank so you. much for your time this evening. Thank you. Okay. And I'll see you again. Okay. Sounds thank wonderful. You. Take thank care. You. Bye. 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 Oh my goodness, everybody. You have to get connected with Lisa. Make sure that you write down her name, which is spelled L-I-S-A, and that is L-A-N-G-L-O-I-S, Langlois, and look up her movies. Make sure you follow. August 2022, you want to look for the Lemonade Stand, which will be coming out on the Hallmark Channel. Everybody, thank you so much for watching the show. We have another one coming right at you on Wednesday evening with Dr. Kiba Green. We're going to be talking about some child psychology and the things that she's seen as a psychologist for the local jails, as well as working with the youth and everything that she does. As always, we are blessed. You are blessed. And I love you. Stay tuned.